meet several of you afterwards. Um, uh, several of you I, I don't think I've met before, but a bunch of you I have. I think it's been about 25 years since I've preached in Columbus, Indiana. Um, and that's when I was here over at 10th Street before it became what it is. Um, so I'm Jeremy DeHutt. I'm here with my family. We've got a friend traveling with us this weekend. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's been on my calendar for a couple of months. Um, what I thought we would do today is uh, there's a series of lessons I've ended up putting together since I traveled to Egypt last fall, um, focusing on the life of Moses, really going through the Exodus. And so I thought I would share some of the pictures from that trip um, and then dive into the Exodus account. And during Bible class, uh, really focusing on chapter one and maybe the first half of chapter two um, of Exodus. So I would like to stop and you know, ask questions, maybe answer some questions you may have along the way. Uh, so if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll try to get to you. Um, but we'll, we'll start moving pretty quick once we get into the text. All right. So um, last fall, our team traveled to Egypt and Jordan uh, for a production trip to put a documentary together on the Exodus. Um, and this is the map that my brother Craig put together for his kids so they could follow where dad was going. Uh, and I stole it from him because he did such a great job. Uh, so we flew into Cairo um, early in October, uh, spent some time there, traveled north to Tel El Daba, uh, which is where historically Goshen was. Um, there were some neat things to see there, a really neat museum. Um, after that, we traveled back a little bit south of Cairo, uh, spent some time on the Nile River. Uh, we went out with a boat captain on a, a little sailboat called a Flecka. Um, and then we took a long, 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 long overnight train to Luxor. Um, don't ever do that. I did it for you. You don't have to do that. Um, lots of stories about that incredibly horrible train ride. Um, and we got down to Luxor, uh, and Luxor was one of their temple cities. So every pharaoh would expand on the city and try to make his addition uh, bigger and more significant than the guy behind him. And so it's a fascinating place. We had less than half a day there, but you could spend days there. Um, so we spent time at Luxor, and then the dot shows where we went next, but it doesn't show the route that we took to get there. Uh, we actually flew from Luxor to Cairo and Cairo down into the Sinai Peninsula, um, took a vehicle to Jebel Musa, which is uh, the traditional Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula, uh, hiked up to the top, um, caught the sunrise, spent the night up top, caught, or caught the sunset, spent the night, caught the sunrise, um, drove down and took a ferry across the Gulf of Aqaba, um, landed in Jordan, went to Wadi Rum, and in Wadi Rum, you all would recognize it. Uh, that's where the original Star Wars was shot. Um, so Tatooine is Wadi Rum. Um, Dune is shot in Wadi Rum. Uh, while we were there, the production was there for Dune 2. They were moving set pieces uh, for Dune 2, which is pretty cool. Uh, we went to Petra. Uh, the Israelites traveled through Petra, but they traveled through before Petra was Petra. Uh, so the, the treasury building that you remember from Indiana Jones was not there when the Israelites went through. Uh, but it was around Petra that Aaron passed away and was buried on one of the mountains there. Uh, and there's a historical site for that. Um, then we traveled up into Amman, uh, which is just a stone's throw away from Mount Nebo. And so we went to Mount Nebo, which is the mountain that Moses went up to look into the promised land before he died. Um, so we did all of that in about 11 days, 11, 12 days. Um, nobody slept for a week and a half. Um, and so I'll show a couple of pictures from that, and uh, then we'll, we'll get into our text. Um, that's our film crew, uh, our production crew for that trip. Um, I won't name everybody's names. You probably recognize a couple of those guys. Uh, my brother is just to the right of me, Craig. Um, but it takes all of those guys and more to do what we do. Uh, that sunrise is from Wadi Rum. So that was really neat to be able to be out there um, and walk around the sand. 
Uh, the picture in the upper right was the gentleman who was the captain of our boat. Um, and his, his ethnicity is pretty neat. He is from, and his family is from, southern Egypt, which is considered upper Egypt, where the prominent pharaohs were from. So people that come from that area make a big deal out of, well, my family's from upper Egypt. Um, even though he works a boat on the Nile in lower Egypt. <laughs> um, but he and his, uh, the men in his family have been doing this for uh, generations. So his father was a captain, his grandfather was a captain, his great-grandfather was a captain. Um, kind of that caste system. They're still doing that. There are people doing that today. Um, the picture in the lower right was a family. Uh, we had just come from a brick making factory. So we made some mud bricks like the Israelites would have made mud bricks. And we were driving through the countryside and we saw this family uh, making their uh, bread for the week in their front yard. They had a, a brick oven that they had made out there. And uh, in that area, it's not a touristy area. Tourists don't go there. And so most of the Egyptians in that area have never met a white guy in person. And so we're just driving down the road and we see this family making bread. And I was like, stop the van, stop the van. And so we back up and a bunch of white guys pile out with cameras. Um, and they usually go, CNN? Like, no, we're not CNN. Um, but they were so hospitable. Um, they actually shared some of their fresh bread with us, shared some of the stuff from their fridge. Um, the father wanted a group picture with us. That's who's standing next to me. Uh, his teenage daughter did not want a picture with us. She's in the yellow shirt in the back, um, but she really did, which is why she's still in the picture. Um, kids are kids no matter where you go and whether you speak the same language. Um, that is a picture of the hike up to the top of the traditional Mount Sinai. And we stopped to take that picture so that our hearts wouldn't explode out of our chest. We were uh, sucking air. So I'm smiling, but I'm like, <laughs> uh, the elevation change, we park at about 5,000 feet above sea level, and then you go up to 7,500 uh, feet above sea level in about three miles. Um, so it's a quick, steep elevation change. Um, as you get closer, <laughs> as you get closer, there's a set of steps, and there are 700 of them. Um, and that is a picture of the steps. They kind of snake back and forth, but like that's a step. It's not a stair. It's like you're hiking on a trail and they threw some rocks and went, oh, there's a step. And then there's a step. Um, and we're not done. There's actually a, another path up that is not open to the public anymore. Uh, that is 3,000 steps. And they call it the steps of repentance. And I think that's because you start and you're like, I repent. I'm not going up this way. And then you turn around and come back down. Um, but our Bedouin, the guy who led us up to the top, could make that hike in 30 minutes while he's smoking a cigarette. And it was crazy. So he was so patient with us. Um, it took us about two hours, a little less than two hours, to make the hike. Uh, that's another perspective, looking down the hike. Um, normally, what you end up seeing on, uh, on media is me hiking somewhere and doing something and I've got my backpack and whatnot. But people don't always think about the rest of the crew, they're lugging gear, they're lugging cameras, sound equipment, electronics, batteries, batteries aren't light. Um, they actually recorded two or three podcasts from the top of Sinai, which means they had the microphones. Um, now they had some animals carrying some of that equipment, but the rest of the team, they're lugging that. Um, that is usually my daily view. They're shooting what's behind me, and I'm looking at a half dozen guys kind of corralling around, uh, barking orders and playing with lenses. And um, That is a nighttime shot. There is a person under every single one of those blankets. It was a full moon that night, so it was super bright. Uh, couldn't see a lot of the stars. Uh, it got down to about 40 degrees, uh, which was super comfortable after being in the heat for several days. We found it really pleasant. Um, the locals thought we were insane because they, to them it was freezing cold. Um, and we were out there with you know an Eddie Bauer lightweight down jacket and that blanket. Um, and that blanket that you see in the very, very front, the one with the red and the black, 
Uh, one of the things I've started doing with my trips is I try to pick up souvenirs that are significant to a trip. You know, a lot of those places sell the same things, whether it's Israel, Turkey, you know, Egypt, Jordan. Um, so I got up in the middle of the night and people are hiking up there all hours of the night because they want to get there for the sunrise. And so I went down to the gift shop that's open 24 hours and went to one of the Bedouin guys and I'm like, hey, um, would you sell me one of the blankets? He's like, you want one of the blankets? Like, no one asks for a blanket because it's an old animal blanket, never been washed. It's wool, smells like a camel. Um, and they sold me a blanket for five bucks. And so I had to roll that up and tie it to my backpack and get it back down. Um, when I got in the car on the way home, Anna picked me up from the airport. Everyone was super excited to have me back in the car. And I got in the passenger seat. But after like five minutes of me talking and talking, Anna was like, we need a shower really bad. I was like, I showered this morning. It's not me. It's the, it's the camel blanket in the suitcase that I picked up to bring it home. She had to wash it three times to get that camel smell out. Uh, but that is actually in my office right now. Um, those are the last few steps going up to the top of the mountain, uh, the last 50 steps or so. Uh, right after I talked to that guy about buying the blanket, I went to the last few steps and took a shot up. So those little white pinpricks are stars. Um, and then... We got up super early and kind of stood out and waited for the sun to rise. And that was the sunrise from the top of the traditional Mount Sinai. Um, and there's so much more that we could talk about and share. Um, hopefully that production will come out uh, maybe around the first of the year, shortly after the first of the year. Um, but after running and sprinting so quick through that, let me stop for a second. Any questions about any of that? No. Yes. Yes. As opposed to this is it. Right. So there are actually, um, there's more than two possible locations. There are two really strong, likely locations. Um, if you've watched the show uh, Patterns of Evidence, they make a case for a location in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I personally don't think Saudi Arabia makes sense, um, but I understand the evidence that they present. So uh, one of the approaches to our trip, since there are a couple of sites that could be it, we don't know for sure, um, our approach to the whole production was we're assuming that the exodus happened. We're assuming it's real. Can I prove with certainty the exact locations? I can't. But what I want to try to understand is what was it like? What would it have been like? And what would the effect be on the people who experienced that? And so ours is not this treasure hunt, we're gonna prove the spot. We're gonna take you through and say, what would the effect of that experience have had on you if you'd been there? Uh, so when I say this is the, the traditional, I'm acknowledging, you know, for thousands of years, they have assumed this is it, but I can't say with certainty this is the place. Um, so I hope that answers the traditional. And that's true even when you're tour, uh, touring Israel. You know, they have, they have kept track of some of these places for hundreds if not thousands of years, but there's no way to prove with absolute certainty it was the spot. And they can say it was in this area but I can't tell you that's the rock, you know? Um, so when we talk about that, it's helpful to be clear with the language that we're using. So great, that was a great observation. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, that's true. So as far as Israel goes, it's actually a little bit closer to the size of New Jersey and, sh and size and shape. Um, so you have a lot less room for error <laughs> when you're looking in Israel and you start to plot the, the rivers and mountains and it's easier to be a little bit more specific. Um, the land mass, when you're talking about the Exodus, you have a lot more options. Um, so yeah, that's a good observation. Said the preacher's wife. Okay, well, let's, uh, we've got a little bit less than half an hour. 
Um, let's see what we can do with uh, Moses' birth. Okay. So, one of the things that I have found helpful is to try to establish context. Um, I think establishing context anytime you're doing a Bible study helps you better understand the purpose and mission of the writer. And so when you're talking about the Exodus, um, everyone has heard about the Exodus. Uh, Non-religious people have heard things about the Exodus. They have heard the name Moses. Um, they have heard the phrase, let my people go. Like they've heard that, Charlton Heston. Um, even on Jebel Musa, there was a guy there uh, that we met that was raised as an Israeli. His father was a rabbi, but he was an atheist. Hiking to the top of Mount Sinai. And we're like, what are you doing up here? Like, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but this is not your faith. And he's like, it's, it's not. And I don't believe that it really happened. But it still has significance to the story of humanity. He's not wrong. Um, although I think it really happened. And if it really happened, it has even more significance. But so the secular world um, sees that there's significance in the story of Mo uh, Moses. So the way Exodus 1 starts is by explaining how the Israelites got to be in Egypt. You have these 70 people from this one family that came down into Egypt and they were saved by Joseph and God's providential care of Joseph. And then over several centuries had grown and grown and grown and grown. And that's what the first paragraph in Exodus 1 establishes. But then after you get past that introduction of 70 people, it explains there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And in my mind, I'm like, how can you not know Joseph? Like Joseph saved the world, the known world at that time from famine. How do you not keep track of that guy? And how do you explain this, this population group that is so big? Like, what do you mean you don't know Joseph? And so going to history, Let's set the historical context for that a little bit, and maybe it'll make more sense. So that is a satellite map of Egypt, and you've got the Nile Delta in the north, and the Nile narrowing down as it heads south. And it gets really confusing because northern Egypt is historically lower Egypt. Southern Egypt is upper Egypt. It's backwards. But those are their designations, okay? And what most people don't realize is when you talk about the dynasties of the rulers that included the pharaohs, you would get competing dynasties, and sometimes dynasties that overlapped with each other. And they would oftentimes be in the north and the south. So the more elite dynasties were in the south. And let's do a little chronology here. So just the way chronology works, before Jesus, we're keeping track of years in reverse. So you go from 1800 to 1700, 1600, 1500, as you get closer to Jesus, right? After Jesus, you start counting in a normal way. So you have these, you have these dynasties, these Egyptian dynasties, especially in the south, and what you end up seeing is you see these Semitic people from 1800 to about 1500 that are establishing a community in northern Egypt. So in the historical record, if you go and they dig up stuff, they start to see in the record up near the Nile Delta, Semitic people. Semitic people are Jewish people. Well, that makes sense because from 18 to about 1500 that you should see that because Joseph's family was there. And so you should see evidence of them somewhere. And then just before 1500, you have this, this group of people. So from your perspective, come down from Canaan into Northern Egypt, attack the Pharaohs there and establish themselves as Pharaohs. So they're foreigners. They're non-Egyptians, 
but they conquer northern Egypt and they call themselves pharaohs. But they're not Egyptian. And history calls them the Hyksos or the Shepherd Kings. And after a while, the southern Egyptians are sick and tired of that. And so they come up and wage war with the Shepherd Kings, defeat them, and kick them out of Egypt. And it's around that time that Moses is born. So think about that for a second. You've got these two sections of Egypt and you have centuries of the Israelites being there, growing in population, growing in population. And we have evidence of them being there. And what they live through is they live through basically a revolt where some foreigners come in and conquer the local pharaohs and establish themselves. And then the southern Egyptians are like, yeah, we're done with that. Defeat the shepherd kings and kick them out. But the shepherd kings and the Israelites come from the same area of the world. And the Israelites are still there. So the southern pharaohs look at the Israelites and start to racially profile. Wait a minute, we've had these people with us for a couple of centuries, but they kind of look like and come from the same place as the people we just kicked out. We don't trust them. And as you start reading down through Exodus 1, the Pharaoh that rose up that didn't know them comes from the south. He doesn't know Joseph. He's removed by centuries. And he's afraid that these people that kind of look like the enemies might rise up and there's going to be unrest. And so out of fear of an uprising from this large population group, he starts to practice genocide. Does that make a little bit more sense about why that happened? Now, you go a little bit later, for, uh, 80 years after the birth of Moses, you have the Exodus. 40 years after that, you have the conquest of Canaan. And what you see in some of the Egyptian writing is you have these words that refer to a group of people called the Apiru, or Hebrew. Okay. Now, this is really hard for us, and I don't think I've done a really good job this morning with this. When Joseph's family went down into Egypt, there was no Israel. There was no nation. They were not the Israelites. They didn't have a law. They didn't have a shared culture. They didn't have an army. It was a big family of 70 people. Like when my family and brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces all get together, there's about 35 of us, which is still pretty big, right? But it was just a big family when they went down and an, and an expanding family before the Exodus. But they are not a nation yet. And so you can't really refer to them as Israelites. They're Hebrews. Ethnically, that's what they are. They haven't been given that designation yet. So it makes sense that you have these references to them that sound like that. Um, we'll skip over that chart, just talking about the, the life of Moses and how it matches up in the chronology of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, so let's talk through Moses' life for a second. Verses 1 through 7, you have the introduction. And let's go ahead and read verses 8 through 12, now that we've established the context. Exodus 1, 8 through 12. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, they more, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So, Pharaoh is using them as a workforce 
and it's economically beneficial to him. But he's trying to suppress them because he's afraid that they're going to rise up. And when it says in verse 11 that they set taskmasters over them, some of those taskmasters were Egyptian. Some of them were likely elevated from among the Israelites. One of the reasons for that was it kept this pipe dream of, hey, if you do this really well, you can live high on the hog and we're going to take care of you. And there's, there's like this little glimmer of hope, right? Uh, it gives them something to shoot for. But you think about what it would mean for that person that got elevated to that position and how his fellow Israelites would look at him. Okay, Similar in the New Testament to the Israelite tax gatherers. They would not like them. Okay, So that's, that's the oppressive part. Let's keep going and talk through most of chapter 1, starting in 13. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field and all their work they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiphrah, the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him, but if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that's born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Okay. There's so much. You just want to slow down and camp there for a second. Let's, let's hit some things on a high level. Really quick. Um, this is not situational ethics. This text is not justifying deception. Okay. When it says that God approved of what the women did, specifically, he's approving their respect for life. The fact that they made a decision to protect life despite risking their own. That's what this text is championing. That they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. Okay, so really high level. I've heard people come here and say, see, depending on the circumstances, God's okay with us lying. That is not what this is teaching. Just like the Old Testament is not saying that polygamy is good. It's not. Now, something else, though. Let, let's just think through what the midwives are saying. What they're told to do is that as the boys are being born, kill them. Sound kind of familiar? It should, because there are places in the U.S. where that's okay. And it's not okay. And it's actually kind of comical the way that these ladies pass it off. When Pharaoh realizes that his command to kill these babies is not being followed, he asks them what is happening. And they're like, look, the, uh, the Hebrew women, they have a little bit more uh, stamina to them. And before we can show up, just they're out. That's not how that works. And Pharaoh, who doesn't understand biology, is like, okay, I guess that's how it works. Um, take your word for it. And so what he ends up doing is coming up with a new method of killing them. We're going to get to that in chapter 2. But what you have is the death of the boys going on there. Now in chapter 1, it says, A man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Let's just stop there for a second. Um, love babies, love babies, love babies. I bet some not beautiful babies. And they grow into it, right? <laughs> they become adorable. They just, they just do. Um, I don't think that's what this is referring to. 
And there are several places. Acts chapter 7 references Moses and what his parents observed about him. And then Hebrews chapter 11 references Moses and what his parents observed about him. Um, I don't think it's talking about his physical appearance. I think what it's referencing is they looked at him and they saw potential about him. Really, you should see that about every child. That every child, God has a purpose for every child. And so they're looking at Moses and they're like, we can't do what Pharaoh's asking us to do. There's more for this baby than to be born and die. And so what Hebrews 11 starts out with is Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11, when it's talking about the faith of people, starts by talking about the faith of Moses' parents. Because they had enough faith that they kept that baby alive at risk of their own life. And for several months kept a loud, whiny, squally, crying baby alive that if the Egyptians had heard, like he was supposed to be chucked in the river before them. But because of their faith in the Lord, it's really similar to the midwives. They feared the Lord more than they feared the edict of Pharaoh. So in verse 2, she hid him for three months, keeping this boy alive. Verse 3, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. Such a sneaky lady. It's obvious she's had a baby. Okay, she was pregnant, and she's not pregnant. And there was a baby in the house, and now there's not a baby in the house. And so if an Egyptian came along, hey, didn't you have a baby? Don't you know you're supposed to put him in the river? I did. I put him in the river. In the river right now. He's in a boat in the river, but he's in the river. Technically, she did. But she's still preserving life. And she didn't just chuck him in the river and then leave him. His sister's watching over him, verse 4. His sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. She wants to see what the outcome is. In verse 5, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And I don't think that's purely coincidental. And while her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent that her servant woman and she took it. There's not normally a basket there. In verse 6, when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew's children. She should have flipped the basket over. And she didn't. She knows what her father has said about the Hebrew children, about the Hebrew boys. But she has pity on him. It's one thing to command something, especially as it relates to people's safety, it's another thing to have to do it when they're right in front of you. And it's kind of like social media. It's really easy to be done with people online when you can't see them or see the effect of what you're saying. But if you're in the room with them and you have to see their face, you see their body language and hear their tone, you're kind of a little bit more compassionate. I think that's a good thing. So in verse 7, as she's putting all this together, his sister pops out. She said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Hey, you've got a baby. You've got a Hebrew baby. I know this Hebrew lady that could probably nurse him for you. It's coincidentally. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Verse 9, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. Best deal ever. You want to wake up in the middle of the night, you've got to feed your baby, you get paid for that by the hour. No other mother in the world gets that. But you think about that. Moses is supposed to be dead. And the way God's providence has worked is he's not only alive, he's still in his family's house. And on top of that, his mother's getting paid to take care of her own baby who should be dead. Like, it's just great all the way around. And even more than that, the, Moses ends up staying there until he's weaned. And so there's this period, Moses is in his family home being influenced by his family for this period of weaning. 
So verse 10, when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. All right, so let's make a couple more observations here. What you see in verses 1 through 3 is really the faith of Moses' parents. In verses 4 through 10, you see the provision of God. Okay. Now, something really neat that we're going to try to do again uh, in the rest of the lessons, both this morning and then this evening, is later on in his life, this is at the end of his life, it's in Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy is a collection of five sermons that Moses preaches to Israel before he dies and before they go in to conquer the land. It's like, I've been with these people for 40 years. What are the last five things I'd like to preach to? Them? And so that's what Deuteronomy is. And in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses said this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. He prophesies, look, down the road, way down the road, God is going to bring you another prophet, another spokesman. And when God raises that person up, pay attention to him. And I would add the caveat, way better than you paid attention to me. Because they didn't always pay very good attention to Moses. And that's a prophecy that Moses foreshadows somebody. And I think we all know who he foreshadows is Jesus. So there's another really neat timeline there. It goes from creation up into the age of the kingdom of Jesus. And you've got the creation, the fall, the flood. You've got the Tower of Babel. Those formative things that happen in Genesis to lead us to the way the world is today. And then you keep going forward. And the most significant thing that we get to is this cross in the red section in the middle where Jesus shows up. The prophesied Messiah is there. And so let's talk about Jesus for just a second and put some pieces together. When you look at Matthew chapter 1, and there's also a section like this in Luke, you have this genealogical section that introduces Jesus. This is how we got to Jesus. There's this family of people who kept receiving this promise of someone's coming, someone's coming, and now here he is. Kind of like Exodus 1. This is this family and how this family got here, and this is how many of them there were, and then you get Moses. Okay? Really, really similar. And then when you get to the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 2, you're introduced to this king, Herod the Great, who's not all that great. I mean, the reason he's called Herod the Great is because of everything that he built and the things that he expanded and what he did in the nation of Israel leading up to the birth of Jesus. But he was a horrible man, and he was super oppressive to the people of Israel. And he was actually trying to hunt down Jesus. Okay, So we're introduced to this ruler that is oppressing the people of Israel. And then in Luke 1, Matthew 1, and Luke chapter 2, you're introduced to the parents of Jesus who have incredible faith. You have the faith of Mary who's being told that she's going to give birth to a child in a really unorthodox way, that the average person without faith is going to look on her with disdain. And she submits to that and says, the Lord's will be done. Which is amazing. And even though they're betrothed, Joseph finds out about that and makes the natural assumption about how biology works and how people come to be pregnant, and he's ready to put her away. But then when it's explained to him that it's by the Holy Ghost and that he should marry her, he goes ahead and does that. But is not physically intimate with his wife until after Jesus is born. And makes Jesus his own child. He adopts him. That takes a lot of faith. And so both parents of Jesus demonstrate incredible faith. This is the, uh, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, where you can go and it's the traditional location of the birth of Jesus. When you get to the end of the room there, this is kind of their uh, front of the area, kind of like this. It's actually a functional worship place still. There are several, several groups that meet there every week. Um, Orthodox Catholic groups for the most part. When Jesus was born, he was laid in a manger, and the majority of the mangers in that area are stone, not wood. So Jesus was likely placed after he was swaddled up 
into a stone manger like that. But similar to Moses, he's connected to the Exodus. Because as Herod tries to kill him, Joseph is warned in a dream to flee to Egypt because he's going to fulfill the prophecy out of Egypt, I have called my son. And so Joseph and Mary and Jesus flee to Egypt and they stay there until Joseph is told, hey, Herod is dead, you can go back. And so he's called out of Egypt. So Jesus and his birth, it's connected to the story of the Exodus. And that's over in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And there's a lot about Jesus' time in Egypt that we just don't know about. The Bible doesn't speak about it. There are traditions, there are stories that have been uh, communicated through the, uh, the years. And there are places in Egypt that you can visit where they say, hey, this is the well where they stopped. And uh, we've got some pictures of that to show later. But also similar to Moses, you have the death of the boys. Because Herod, when he realizes he's lost track of Jesus, decides to do a, a radical thing and kill all of these boys. And in my mind as a kid, I always made it this big, massive genocidal thing. And it wasn't. Not on the scale of the Exodus. Because he knew it was in Bethlehem. And so he goes through Bethlehem, but because of his uncertainty about the circumstances, it's not just infants. He actually kills boys up to a certain age. Now, there's a location in the foundation underneath the Church of the Nativity where a long time ago they found a bunch of ossuaries or bone boxes that were uh, that contained the remains of infant and toddler boys. Some of those bone boxes are there. Those little alcoves are where they found those bone boxes. And so they've named that cave the Cave of Innocence. And so you can imagine, you know, what, what would that have been like if I'd lived in Bethlehem when Herod realized, hey, the competing baby king supposed Messiah is there, and I'm not sure exactly where he's at. I've lost track of him. The wise men never came back. They took off. What are we going to do? And so he comes to town and has his guys kill a bunch of kids under the age of two. But in Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, after he dies, God sends him back. And so all through that, there is no way that you can read Exodus 1 and 2 and not see the hand of God. Moses should not have survived, but he did. Moses should not have spent time with his family. Moses should not have lived a life of luxury. Moses should not, but he did. And that's because of God's providence. Same thing with Jesus. He should not have survived. He shouldn't have. He shouldn't have had his, his parents stay together, but they did. He shouldn't have survived Herod, but he escaped and came back when it was safe. All of that is because of the provision of God. So some of the lessons that we'll hit, we'll just say these quickly. Every deliverer God raised up pointed to our ultimate deliverer, Jesus. And God is providentially working through history to accomplish his redemptive plan. And he plays the long game. We need to be patient with him as he does that. The life of every child is precious to God and should be to us as well. And then finally... We need to follow the example of both sets of parents and live by faith, no matter the personal cost. Right? And we just sprinted, and we're being invaded by little people. So, the Bible class is yours, and we'll continue with the story of Moses during the sermon. Thank you, guys.